Well, folks, everything that I'm going to say this morning will, of course, come from my heart. I pray that the Lord will anoint it. I feel like that the Lord gave me an awful lot of this to say. I pray he gave all of it to me, but I'm not going to be so bold or arrogant to assume. But I ask that the, the Lord will speak it to your heart. Now, I'm going to do something this morning that I very seldom do when I preach. You, you know that I am a much more freestyle type of preacher. I do a lot of study, a lot of research, and a lot of prayer before I get up here on Sunday mornings. But I usually don't come up here and read a bunch of stuff to you. And I'm not going to read a bunch of stuff, but there are some things that need to be read, and you'll understand why as I read them. And so I will do a lot more reading this morning than I would normally do. And I'm saying that for the sake of guests. I, uh, I, I grew up in several churches where the entire sermon was read and the preacher had his glasses on and he looked down at the pulpit the whole time. I, that's tough for me to handle. <laughs> and for most people it is as well. So I like to move around and speak to you, look you in the eye while we're preaching, look at the word together, and, and I already know where I'm going and know what the Lord's put in my heart and to speak it freely like that. And Well, I'm going to speak freely this morning, and I will also take times just like I'm doing right now in the middle of all of this, but, but I just wanted to tell you that. So, 245 years from the time we claimed and fought and earned and or was blessed by heaven's hand with our independence 245 years today. And we're on a precipice. We are on a precipice. I, I don't have any predictions or prophecies for you. You know, I've been preaching for well over a decade. We're living the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. And I have proved that through many, many sermons over and over again. And with every passing week and month and year, those prophetic revelations continue to pile up. They come right off the pages of Scripture. Some of them directly and literally. Others of them a little more metaphorically and parabolically, but they fit within the contextual understanding of God's Word. And so we can understand. There is no denying that we are the first generation in 2,800 years to see the prophetically proclaimed return of Israel, and we're now in the 73rd year of its return. You can't deny that. That's a fact of history, and it's a fact that the Bible bore out for thousands of years before it happened. It was going to happen. It was going to happen. It was going to happen, and then you would know that it's getting close to the return of the Lord. I don't set dates. I don't wring my hands. But I do want God's people to know the truth about what the Word of God says and the days we're living in and why a lot of things that we're watching happen around the world and particularly in this nation and not that we're so great in that sense, but, but we are unique. So much so that just a few weeks ago, the conclusion of another poll, I don't know how often they do these, every year or two, a global survey and these come from major polling institutions. A global survey just a few weeks ago said and listed the top 10 places in the world where immigrants desire to go and to live and to make their home. And it listed these places from 9 to 8 to 7 to 6 to 5 to 4 3 2. And before it got to number 1, it said, and as long as we've been doing these polls, this has been number 1. And once again, it is far and away the most desired nation for immigrants to come to, to live, to make their home. The United States of America. And they said, with all of its problems, with all of its ills, people still feel like more than any place in the world, and I know some people listening from other nations may not agree with this assessment, but this is an assessment of a global sampling. So it may not apply to you individually, or it may. But this particular poll said that they felt that the people that said, that's where we want to go, that they felt here they had more opportunity 
to advance themselves, more opportunity for some semblance of freedom, more opportunity for their children to grow up in some semblance of freedom, to get an education, to provide a living for their families, and to better themselves than in any other nation of the world. Now, obviously, there are still down the list, number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. so not everybody feels that way. But their words, their words, by far and away, over any other nation, the United States of America. Now, we live in Satan's world. It is fallen. It is depraved. Unless a person is born again and has the Holy Spirit of God convicting them and in their life and sanctifying them and teaching them and correcting them and chastising them, even disciplining, the Bible says, if you belong to God as his child, he'll discipline you. You're still saved, you're still his, but he will let you know when you've stepped out of line so you can repent and get it right. But in the midst of all of that, we know that the Lord is using, even with all the evils of this world and the evils in this nation, and there are a cornucopia of them, and always have been, because since the flood, since the Garden of Eden, this is Satan's domain. Jesus himself said he is the prince of this world. Notice he didn't call him king of this world or lord of this world or the, or the God, capital G, of this world. He did call him the God of this age, little g, of this age. In other words, a little short reign. Called him the prince of this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. The more that technology increases, the more we laugh about that, but I don't think it's really meant to be laughed at. I think there's a lot that has to do with technology and the power of the air that Satan controls. What do you think? So, I'm not saying that to excuse any evil in our nation, but these kinds of evil that are in our nation are ubiquitously found all over the planet in every nation, and in some nations, it is so thick, it is repressive and dangerous every day of your life to live in a place and then proclaim the name of Jesus in the midst of that darkness. What I'm trying to say is what the majority of the world of immigrants realizes is that even in the darkness of the world, even in the darkness that is around us, and again, this is not to excuse it. We've got to fight the darkness. We've got to expose the darkness. People don't like it. I've been preaching, teaching, exposing darkness even in our own community for over 30 years. We've had scores of people leave this church mad because I dared to shine a light in the darkness around here. They have. People don't like it. But even in that, we understand. And the majority, their words, by far and away understand that there's more light to be shared, more light to be had, more preaching of the gospel to be heard, more freedom to be discovered and grasped in this nation as a whole than any other nation of the world. That's what we're fighting for, folks. That's what we celebrate when we sing these hymns of faith, giving God the glory for the freedom that we have. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. You know what grace means, don't you? He's given us something we don't deserve. Grace. That's what we say about gracious people when they give you a, a gift that just blows you away. You didn't ask for it. You didn't think you were going to get it. You don't deserve it. He said, wow, they were gracious to me. America, America. God has poured out his grace on thee. Amen? Are you with me? This is what we're praying for. This is what we're fighting for. I posted on social media, I think it was just yesterday. I can define, politically speaking, humanly speaking, physically speaking, nationally speaking, I can define in three words, just three words, why I stand and put my hand over my heart when the flag is unfurled or when we sing the national anthem. These three words. Arlington National Cemetery Amen. filled, is 
far as you can see, carved in stone the names of people who put their lives in harm's way, some who gave their lives, many who gave their lives in the service of our nation so that we could sit here this morning and so that I can say what I'm getting ready to say without going to jail. My knee bows for nobody but Jesus Christ. He is my King of kings and Lord of lords no matter what happens to the United States of America. But, not, but next to that, and not even a second, not even a close second, okay? I don't idolize this nation. But next to my knee bowing to Jesus Christ, I'm also deeply grateful to the Lord that I can live here and understand and live every day what billions of people around the world only dream of. And I get to live it every day. In this fallen, filthy, dark, nasty world, I get to live it. And I'm grateful. No matter what happens to the world or what happens to the United States, and I'm going to use my life to advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ, number one, far and away the most, but also to do my best to preserve and protect as the pastors and patriots and people of 245 years ago did. And I'll show you that in just a moment. To preserve something for our children and grandchildren the Lord gives it to us. I think the two almost go hand in hand, advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ and somehow preserving the constitutional republic and the rule of law and the sanity of what America is supposed to be and has been pretty much by and large. There are evil forces, evil powers, evil people, all of it generated by Satan, please. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, right? But there are evil forces, powers, and people who are desperately, daily, trying to snatch that from you and your families. We've got a lot of children up here seeing a lot of young people in our church. A lot of young adults here. I'm passionate. And I'm not your hero or Superman. And a lot of other people here feel the same way I do. It's just I've got the microphone, so I'm going to say, I am passionate about protecting your ability to live in some semblance of what I grew up in, of freedom. I, I, I don't want you having to live in a communist, socialist, fascist regime that has just shoved down your throat and your freedoms taken from you. So I'm going to do what I can to preserve, and many others are as well, but I'm just saying, I've got the microphone standing here, I'm telling you, I'm going to do what I can. And I'm not ashamed to do it. There are always forces of power and voices out there saying to me, preacher, you need to quit preaching all that politics. And I just look at him and say, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. So, having said that, let me remind you of some other polls, and then there's another brand new one, and then I want to get right into this. But, but this, is, this sets it up. This gives the foundation to it. I, I told you several weeks ago that about maybe a year or less ago, and of course I've got my hands on it and been reading it to you several times, that 70% of people in America claim that they are Christians when asked. Now, this certainly doesn't look like a nation where 70% of the people are Jesus-loving, spirit-filled, Bible-believing, church-going, singing in the choir kind of Christians. I mean, it just doesn't look that way to me. It doesn't sound that way. But I'd rather it be 70% at least say that than I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that, you know. At least they give some, some salute to the truth. But what really ripped my heart about a year ago was when the Barna poll came out that was the result of several years of research. Out of that 70%, when asked the questions, the foundational questions of our faith, you believe the Bible is the only word of God? Do you believe that it is the infallible word of God? Do you believe Jesus is the only way to salvation? Do you believe that salvation is by God's grace alone? And do you believe that Israel has a right to exist and it is a prophetic pr pr pronouncement of God's word before our face? Do you believe, do you believe, do you believe? It's called a biblical worldview. Out of the 70%, only 6% said we have a biblical worldview. 
Now that makes more sense to me based upon what I see. But see, that's important because as I've preached before, everybody has a worldview. It's an atheist worldview, secularist worldview, a religious worldview. You know, well, any religion will do. Any, there are many paths to a religious worldview. It could be a communist worldview, a fascist worldview, a socialist worldview. A biblical worldview is miles apart and elevated above all of those others for various reasons. That would be a whole other sermon, but it is. I stand in a biblical worldview. I believe many of you would say that you do as well. But understand, we are now in the minority all over the world and in our nation. So there's that. And then I have quoted this statistic to you many times over and have put it in several of the books that I've published and referenced it. That the Barna poll that took place in our nation over years, interviewing thousands and thousands and thousands of conservative evangelical pastors asking them questions like, do you ever preach on abortion? Do you ever preach on what a real marriage is? Do you ever preach on what a real gender is and manhood and womanhood and childhood and home and marriage and family? Do you ever preach on prophetic times we're living in and Israel being a prophetic sign in the last days and all of these things? Out of thousands and thousands and thousands, that's a huge sampling, by the way, of conservative evangelicals in America, 90% of the pastors say we never talk about those things. Mm, that lines up with the 6% worldview, I think. I mean, it explains a lot, doesn't it? 90% of the pastors, when they were asked why, their, their general umbrella answer was because it'll make people mad, they'll leave, and they'll take the money, and we can't pay for our buildings. That was the general umbrella answer. There were other little nuances to it, but I'm just capturing it. Our nation's on, the precip on a precipice. You know what that is, don't you? You've seen me on a precipice up here many times as I preach, right? <laughs> Walk around, <laughs> especially those of you on the front row. I can always tell when I'm getting too close to the edge, I can hear people go, <gasps> <laughs> that's a precipice right there. One misstep and I'm in trouble. Our nation's on a precipice. One or two more missteps and we've had it. Biblically, spiritually, politically. You do know that there are gigantic, powerful nations and conglomerations of nations of this world that are ready to pounce. They hate what we stand for. And they want this land because it is rich in all the natural resources of the world. Name it, it's here. They want it like empires before, conquering and being conquered. Freedom is not free. It has to be fought for. It has to be earned. It has to be kept. People have to sacrifice. Out of our entire population, I think it's like less than 3% of the entire population of America serves in the totality of all the branches of the armed forces put together. 3% maybe a little less, protects the other 97% of us. It's pretty amazing to think about, isn't it? And look at the strength God has blessed us with, the power, the might. But it doesn't take but a couple of administrations of people that hate all that we stand for to dilute that power, that might, that strength, to dilute our relationships around the world and open the gates for the enemy to walk in. It only takes an administration or two. That's all. Our founding fathers knew that. I ask you to turn to the book of Psalms. Please do if you haven't already, but I, I'll give you the exacting psalm in a moment, but I don't want to until we get there because I want you to hear the setup for all of this. Let me put where we are like this. I'm going to borrow some famous words and change them a little. There's real, I'm not doing any violence to those words, and you will soon recognize those words almost immediately. 
but I want to change them to make them a little more applicable to our day and our time. Okay? Here we go. 245 years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men, and that word men meant all people, are created equal and are endowed by the thing with, uh, oh, that's what Biden says, I'm sorry, and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Could you go ahead and put the, the, the uh, PowerPoint up? Just, a, just some graphics I'm going to show you in a moment that will go along with this. Well, that's a good place to start. Amen. Just let that fly in the background for a minute. The most re politically revered and studied document on the planet, studied all over the world, often with much reverence, sometimes studied just with anger, but the most revered political document on the planet according to all the surveys that have been going on for decades and decades, is the United States of America Declaration of Independence. It's comprised of 32 paragraphs and five distinct divisions. I'm only going to read four of those 32 paragraphs. The first three and then the last one, just to remind us. 245 years ago, a bunch of brave men. And, I, and I'm going to include the women. I'm not trying to be politically correct. We call them, I, I usually say founders. We usually say founding fathers. But almost every one of them had women, their wives, their moms, sisters, <laughs> standing behind them, with them, beside them, praying for them, some serving right along the side of them. Some propping them up when they didn't think the men didn't think they could go anymore, and women are really good at that. I'm married to one like that. If it wasn't for her, I, I would not be your pastor. I mean, I just there were times I just flat wanted to give up, and God used her. So I, I recognize that. So women, please hear me. But but these men, these 56 men, signed. A lot of them signed their death warrant. They put their name on a document that the first three paragraphs begins like this <clears throat> and then the last paragraph. The most revered political document on the planet to this day. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to this separation. The next sentence. So we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that in order to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers, their just powers, from the consent of the governed. And that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. You know why the leftists hate this document. And to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. 
Prudence indeed will dictate, this is paragraph three, that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown us that mankind are more disposed to suffer along while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object invents a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, we're almost there. It is the people's right, it is their duty to throw off that kind of government and to provide new guards for their future security. And such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. Thank you for keeping up with the PowerPoint. You'll get it as I move along. You'll know when to change. Last paragraph. We, therefore, the representatives of, and it says United States of America, but the U is small because they hadn't thought of calling themselves yet. They were just saying, we've got these colonies. We want to make them into states, and we stand united in this. But it's cool that that's where our name comes from. It comes from the Declaration of Independence with a capital U. We, therefore, the representatives of these United States of America, in general Congress, see they had already, Congress just means a, a huge assembly. They had already begun, the, these fathers, and they, they, you'll see in a moment, they were lawyers and merchants and landowners, and it was, it's crazy, just folks like us that were meeting and saying, we've got to do something about this. We've got, and 56 people signed a document and said, we're going to take on the largest nuclear world power the planet has ever seen the British Empire under King George, and we're going to get our independence. 56 people. We could put all of them on one little section of our church over here and have many seats left over. Just giving you perspective. We, therefore, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world, for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of a right ought to be free and independent states and that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Their sacred honor lives on. Some of them lost their lives. Many of them lost their fortunes. But we sit here today because of that declaration the most revered political document on the planet to this day. There were 56 signers. I went through them all, and this is the conglomeration of what they were. They were lawyers, merchants, landowners, a couple of physicians, a couple who listed themselves scientists, a couple who were printers in printing shops. One listed himself as a musician. That was his livelihood. There were several who were inventors. The youngest of the 57, excuse me, the 56, was a 26-year-old lawyer from North Carolina. The oldest was the man who listed himself as a scientist and a printer. He was from Pennsylvania. He was 70 years old. His name was Benjamin Franklin. The majority of the 56 signers were between the ages of 30 and 50 years of age. One of the signers was a pastor. Only one, but he represented a ton of others. Let me tell you about him. His name is John Witherspoon from New Jersey. 
but he was born in Scotland, educated at Edinburgh. He came to America in 1768 to be president of the College of New Jersey. It's called Princeton today. A pastor. Princeton was started as a seminary, as a Bible college, as a, as a college of education, but with a biblical background. Boy, has it gone down the toilet since then in that regard. President of the College of New Jersey, now known as Princeton, position he held until 1792 when he became blind and it forced his retirement. Witherspoon has been called by historians the most influential professor and pastor in American history, not only because of his powerful writing and speaking style, but also because of his long tenure at Princeton. His teachings and the reforms he made there radiated his influence across the nation. He trained not only a substantial segment of the leadership among Christians in America, but he trained a number of political leaders as well. Oh, so much for, preacher, you need to stay out of politics. Yeah. Christians, y'all need to stay out of politics. That's not the way this nation was founded. Witherspoon preached a sermon. It was titled, The Dominion of Providence Over the Passions of Men. It uh, really stirred up the country. He preached it in Princeton. It's published in Philadelphia in 1776, just before the Declaration of Independence was signed. And it was about a month before he was elected to the Continental Congress on June the 22nd. And he preached it. In the sermon, he just reminded those of his critics. And there, he had a lot of critics for this sermon. He said, this is my first sermon addressing political matters from the pulpit. And here's what he said. Ministers of the gospel have more important business to attend to than every single little secular crisis that comes along. I agree with that. But, of course, the subject of liberty, freedom, is more than a merely secular matter. In other words, he was saying, that's a biblical issue. See, Satan has developed a neat little trick in our culture that has largely silenced pulpits. 90% of conservative evangelicals admit it. Only 6% of Christians now hold a worldview in America. They've de Satan came up with a plan. Take biblical issues and turn them into overtly political issues. Then you tell Christians and, and, and pastors to stay out of politics. And they will obey. Satan did. Our politicians, Satan whispered in their ear, they did. And our pastors have obeyed. And most Christians have obeyed. What are these issues? All the issues of the sanctity of the womb, uh, the sanctity of marriage. The sa I, could go, I could go on down the list. All of these things that are so biblical. The sanctity of national borders. The sanctity of the rule of law the sanctity of nation, national sovereignty. All of these things are in the Word of God and all of them were given to us from God's throne in the beginning. But they've been turned into overtly political matters and we've been told you cannot speak of these things. And a lot of American pastors and American Christians have succumbed. This is what Witherspoon was talking about. He says, no, we can't just run around and, you know, oh, they didn't put a stop sign up up here. Well, preacher, let's get something going on this. <laughs> he said, there are a lot of things. We just, you know, we do our civic duty. We vote. We go to county commission meetings. But, but we don't, you know, we don't address it from the pulpits in a way with fire and passion because it just is just the stuff of life. But when it comes to matters of the sanctity of marriage and the womb and the family and childhood and gender and our borders and our nation and, and freedom itself, those need to be screened from the pulpit. But because so many congregations have been brainwashed into thinking, well, the preacher's over into politics now, people get up and leave. 
And that has happened all over America for decades. It's happened right here for decades. I've seen it. People ask me sometimes, aren't you going to go get them, preacher? Heck no. No. If they're offended because I preach on the sanctity of marriage, then they probably won't be happy here. There are a lot of churches you can go to where you'll never hear it spoken. But not this one. That's what Witherspoon was saying. Let me move along. So there was another man by the name of Jacob Duche, Christ Church, Pennsylvania. Interesting fellow. Christ Church, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia is still there. The cemetery is still there. It uh, holds the tombs of many of our founding fathers because of the first Continental Congress held in Philadelphia. A lot of our founding fathers went to that church. Not all of them, but a ton of them did. Thomas Jefferson was there at a very important time. Benjamin Franklin. I think that's Benji, isn't it? Yep, Benjamin Franklin. He is buried there. That's where you'll find their tombs. So here's what happens. In September of 1774, that's almost two years before they signed the Declaration of Independence, the Continental Congress is meeting. Please understand that these guys, you heard what they said in the Declaration of Independence, like when one people break from the nation that they're a part of, we owe the whole world an explanation. In other words, they understood this was a very, this was a sacred thing they were doing, a dangerous thing they were doing, and not something to be taken lightly and not something to be done often. That's what they said. You can't just, every, every time something happens in the country you don't like and a new administration comes in, they do stuff you don't like, you can't just take up arms and say, well, we're starting over again. But they said, but there is a point when you have to do that. There is a point when your liberties are so trampled and the law is so ignored and the the rule of law is just spit upon to where you realize you're getting ready to live under despotism. You're getting ready, we would now call that communism, socialism, fascism, Marxism, all of these different things. You're getting ready, and, and, and something's got to be done. They didn't want to. They kept writing letters to the king and to the parliament. They, they, were, they were citizens of Great Britain. They were living in the colonies producing raw goods and services to ship back to the motherland. Some of them were born in the motherland. Some of them had been born in the colonies, but I mean, that, they were all, it was all a part of the same country. And they didn't want to break from that. They were, they were begging Parliament and the king because by the time we get up to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the British were already firing cannon fire into Boston. And prior to that, they had already gone into Boston and New York and they were going door to door encouraging neighbors to spy on neighbors. They were going door to door trying to disarm the people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It had come to that, and, and, and this went on for years. Well, it, it ramped up in the last months of that, but for years they could smell it coming. They could see it coming. And so the, the, these people were meeting. They were congressing themselves, Congress, and from together, and they were actually had a little system whereby different colonies could send delegations that they would elect so that not just any Yehu would show up in these meetings, but people who were really sold out and wanted to see something done. They had no intention of breaking from Great Britain. They were just saying, you can't have our guns. You can't make us spy on each other. You can't just burst into our homes and take our property. You can't be firing cannon fire into your own countrymen. So the Congress met two years before they finally signed the Declaration of Independence. And listen to this. John Adams, you can put his picture up there. One of our founding fathers. Click it over to John Adams. There's not a John Adams? Well, that's my bad then. Okay. 
Okay, just leave it there because we're going to talk about Duche here. Watch this. John Adams eventually would become America's second president. You, you, you know what he was doing before that? He was studying to be a pastor. <laughs> His wife, Abigail, was a minister's daughter. They were both born into lines of New England Puritan pastors. They were both well-versed in the Scripture. And the letters that they wrote to each other, we have a lot of them still preserved. They're filled with biblical references back and forth to each other. They express their love to each other and they, ex they express their love for the Lord. I'm going to read to you a portion of a letter that he wrote describing what happened in that Congress when it first met September 1774. He writes, When our Congress first met, Mr. Cushing made a motion that it should be opened with prayer. It was opposed by Mr. J of New York, <laughs> where else? And Mr. Rutledge of South Carolina, because we were so divided in religious sentiments among us, if they could have only celebrated that at that point, but they didn't. He said there were some of us that were Episcopalian, some Quakers, some Baptists, some Presbyterians, some Congregationalists, and it became such that we could not join in the same act of worship. That's what John Adams is saying. So he continues to write, but Mr. Samuel Adams who was John's second cousin who was there, arose and said that he had no problem, that he was no bigot, these are his words, and that he could hear a prayer from a gentleman of piety and virtue who was at the same time a friend to this country. He said he had heard that Reverend Duche in Pennsylvania served that deserved that definition of character, and therefore he moved that Reverend Duche, an Episcopal clergyman, might be desired to read prayers to Congress tomorrow morning. The motion was seconded and passed in the affirmative. Reverend Duche, the very next morning, appeared with his clerk and read the 35th Psalm. Our nation was born on the 35th Psalm. Don't turn there yet, because I want you to listen. You must remember, he says, this was the next morning after we heard the horrible news that Britain had cannonaded Boston. I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It seemed as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read on that morning. After this, Reverend Duche, unexpected to everybody, struck out into an extemporary prayer which filled the soul of every man present. I must confess, I never heard a more powerful prayer or one so well pronounced. It has had an excellent effect upon everyone in this Congress. And I must beg you to read that Psalm 35. Turn to Psalm 35. John Adams has begged us. Remember the background. Parliament and the king in the military turning on its own citizens in the colonies, going door to door in the big cities, encouraging each other to spy on each other, encouraging families to turn in families, friends to turn in friends, neighbors to turn in neighbors. They didn't have internet and social media back then and cell phones. If they did, it would have been a whole lot easier for them. But they just did what they, that was their way of doing it. They were going door to door, and if they found somebody that was not completely loyal to the crown, then they went to those doors and said, we need to get your guns. I'm glad nothing like that's going on in our nation now. They were spying on each other. They were lying on each other. They were attacking each other, the colonists especially, those that were even meeting in this Congress. And this is what Reverend Duche read. Now, the context is King David as he was enduring some of the same kinds of ills and attacks. But this is the psalm that laid the foundation for 245 years of the United States of America. And listen to how it fits perfectly. John Adams was overwhelmed. Psalm 35. Contend, O Lord, 
with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and buckler. Arise, O Lord, and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your... Isn't that cool? We already know what that is. Yeshua, I am your salvation. And that translates to Jesus. <laughs> I am, you, you see this throughout the scriptures. The name of Jesus is found throughout the Old Testament. I am your salvation. May those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. May they be like chaff before the wind when the angel of the Lord driving them away. May their path be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them since they hid their net for me without cause and without cause dug a deep pit for me. May ruin overtake them by surprise. May the net they hid entangle them. May they fall into the pit to their ruin. I like these kind of prayers. <laughs> By the way, in theological circles, these are called imprecatory prayers. That is, were you asking God to intervene on sake of those that are, have declared themselves to be your enemy and they're out to destroy you? So you basically pray, Lord, destroy them first. This is an imprecatory prayer, but look. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in His, there it is again, Yeshua. My whole being will exclaim, Who is like you, O Lord? You rescue the poor from those too strong for them, the poor and needy from those who will rob them. Ruthless witnesses come forward. They question me on things I know nothing about. This was happening in the colonies. They repay me evil for good. They leave my soul forlorn. Yet when they were ill, it's because it's their, their, their fellow countrymen is the way they're looking at this, I put on sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. When my prayers returned to me unanswered, I went about mourning for them as though for my friend or my brother. I bowed my head in grief as though weeping for my mother. But when I stumbled, they gathered in glee. Attackers gathered against me. When I was unaware, they slandered me without ceasing. Like the ungodly, they maliciously mocked. They gnashed their teeth at me. Oh, Lord, how long will you look upon on this? Rescue my life from their ravaging, my precious life from these lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly among throngs of people. I will praise you. Let not those gloat over me. By the way, the lion was the national symbol. Who are my enemies without cause? Let not those who hate me without reason maliciously wink the eye. They do not speak peaceably, but devise false accusations against those who live quietly in the land. You could put in there, in the colonies. They gape at me and they say, aha, aha, with our own eyes we've seen it. O oh Lord, you have seen this. Be not silent. Do not be far from me, O oh Lord. Arise, awake to my defense. Contend for me, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me in your righteousness, O oh Lord, my God. Do not let them gloat over me. Do not let them think, aha, just what we wanted. Or say, we have finally swallowed him up. May all those who gloat over my distress be put to shame and confusion. May all who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and disgrace. May those, those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, the Lord is exalted, who delights in the well-being of his servants. My tongue will speak of your righteousness and of your praises all day long. Amen? Amen? Amen. This psalm is what John Adams was talking about. Reverend Duche read that psalm and then broke into a prayer that brought many of those in that Congress to their knees. And that painting, if you could go back to that painting, or, or maybe go forward, does it show him, uh, is there one with him preaching that? I mean, standing at the pulpit, go forward. Yeah, there he is. And you see some on their knees, look at him. This was a painting rendered to depict what happened. And that's Reverend Duche reading Psalm 35 in the First Continental Congress. Reverend Duche struck again in 1776. He preached from one verse, Galatians 5.1. I'll tell you what it is. The verse says, It is for freedom that Jesus Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. <laughs> It was a 25-page sermon written on that one verse. I read the whole sermon. So I'm going to read 24 of those pages to you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm going to read four paragraphs. But there's a reason. Here's four paragraphs of Reverend Duche's sermon. 
From this passage in Galatians, then it appears that the liberty with which Christ hath made us free is nothing less than such a relief from the arbitrary power of sin, such an enlargement of the soul by the efficacy of divine grace, and such a total surrender of the will and affections to the influence and guidance of the Holy Spirit as will enable us to live in the habitual cheerful practice of every grace and virtue here and qualify us for the free, full, and uninterrupted enjoyment of heavenly life and liberty hereafter. These glorious privileges being once obtained, the sinner being once justified by Jesus Christ and adopted into the family of God and having received the seal of his heavenly citizenship by the Holy Spirit is not commanded to march upon the devil's ground or to seek out the tempter or the temptation in order to make a trial of his strength or merely that he might have the honor of a victory. But ours is only to stand fast, to act upon the defensive, to be armed at all points with a heavenly display of power and armor. He's referring to Ephesians 6. To be ready to resist and repel the most daring attempts of his perditious foe as well knowing that if he suffers himself to be taken captive, slavery and woe must be his everlasting portion. But if he comes off conqueror from the conflict, that the life, liberty, and the joys of heaven will be his everlasting reward. That sermon was preached June 1776 in church that day. He was in the process of drafting the Declaration of Independence. And out of that sermon and the impact and the inspiration of that sermon, it would later go down in history. These words were given credit to that pastor. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson was there. He heard this message on one verse of Scripture about our freedom that comes first from Jesus Christ. That freedom is free by the grace of God. But as we walk through this demonic, dark world, any freedom we have in this world is not free. It's got to be sacrificed for, fought for sometimes. We take it in prayer before God's throne. We ask for supernatural intervention and strength. But we don't get to live in a free nation and then just live like we want to live and just always be free. No. Because the evil one will overwhelm us with his evil and captive, make captives and slaves of us. Ask the children of Israel who went into slavery and bondage in Babylon. That's the precipice we're upon. You want to hear something sad about Reverend Duchesne? I guess in a way he is an American hero. He's a pastor. Two years prior to that sermon, he read Psalm 35, and those congressmen hit their knees. And from that understanding that neighbor can't turn upon neighbor, you can't tell lies on each other, you can't lie and wait and trap each other and entrap each other. And you, you can't do those things. That's when they had to resolve, we've got to stand against this. And in the meantime, Great Britain starts sending their cannon fire into Boston, going door to door to take guns. Then, then, Reverend Duchesne gets up and reads Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, preaches a 24, 25-page sermon. Thomas Jefferson is sitting there. He puts those words in the Declaration of Independence. 56 people sign it. And we're off and running. Something sad about Reverend Duche. He was loyal to the crown, and, and I get that. All of them were. He took part in all of these things with passion. But when it came right down to it, and the troops started emptying out on the shores. 
he knelt and gave his allegiance to the king of England. He started well. And in that, he goes down in our history as a hero of sorts, but he didn't finish well. He was a pastor. He was a Christian. I think of what's happened in our nation in the last year, year and a half. Doors closed, congregations closed. The latest polling shows, I saved this one to the last. Just a few months ago, it came out. To this day, with the pandemic numbers going down and people taking off masks and all that, over 25% of regular church attenders who left the churches, most of them because they shut down, said, we're not coming back. And if we do, it'll be a long time from now. If we do. There's darkness sweeping over this land, folks. From the White House to the pulpits, to the pews, we're on a precipice. I want you to hear some words of Calvin Coolidge. preached this at the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but he spoke it. He was the president. He spoke it on July 5th, 1926. Just a couple paragraphs. Listen. He says, so when we take all the circumstances and influence of faith permeating through the early colonies into consideration, it is but natural that the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence should open with a reference to nature's God and should close in the final paragraphs with an appeal to the supreme judge of the universe and an assertion of a firm reliance of divine providence. Coming from these sources, having as it did this background, it is no wonder that Samuel Adams would say, quote, the people seem to recognize this declaration as though it were a decree given directly from heaven. He says, no one can examine this record and escape the conclusion that in the great outline of its principles, the declaration was the result of the biblical teachings of the preceding period. They had aroused the thought and stirred the people of the colonies in preparation for this world-changing event. And these are his concluding statements. It was a long speech, and I'm just giving you a couple paragraphs. No other theory is adequate to explain or comprehend the Declaration of Independence. It is the product of the spiritual insight of the people. We now live in an age of science and of abounding accumulation of material things. This is 1926, the Roaring Twenties. The people of the colonies... Oh, excuse me, I, I, I skipped. I'm sorry. Material things. But this science and these material things, they did not create our declaration. Our declaration created them. The things of the Spirit must always come first. Whew, wish we had presidents speaking those things. And unless we cling to that truth, all of our material prosperity... Overwhelmingly, though it may appear to us, it will turn to a barren scepter in our grasp. If we are to maintain the great heritage which has been bequeathed to us, we must be like-minded as our fathers before us who created it. We must not sink into a pagan materialism. We must cultivate the reverence which they had for the things that are holy. And we must follow the spiritual and moral leadership, which they showed. Amen. Yes. But we have not. And so here we are. All of our fathers before us tried to warn us. My little old simple self has been trying to warn this whole world in our community and this church for 34 years that these days were coming. People got mad and left, didn't want to hear it. If the statistics hold true, the vast majority of them didn't even have a biblical worldview in the first place. They wanted to come. They wanted to do some churchy things, feel good, and go home and pretend like nothing bad was going on. 
that there was nothing to fight, nothing to stand against, no, no spiritual warfare happening. It's just those crazy preachers making that up. Our founding fathers knew differently. They lived it. They spilled their blood. They gave up their fortunes and honor so that we could sit here today and so that I could preach this. I don't know if this sermon will be allowed to stay on YouTube or if we will even be allowed to post on YouTube anymore. By the way, for those of you that um, watch us on Facebook and YouTube, if they ever delete us, don't worry. You can still get the service live at my website, carlgals.com, and at hickorhammockbaptist.org. We've got an independent streaming service. We'll stream it live right to those services. Don't even worry. We use Facebook and YouTube because so many people gather there, but don't worry about that. We're not going to be a slave to the social media giants. We're not going to spy on each other and turn in our neighbors. Ain't nobody taking my guns. And if I can help it, they're not going to take this nation. This is our home. This is our heritage. This has been God's gift to us, and it is to the world. If you don't believe it, ask the world. And if the light of this nation goes out, darkness will sweep this world. But there is a day, there is a day coming and there's a generation coming that will see something similar to that. I don't know how it's going to affect the United States, but it's called the kingdom of the Antichrist, which is spoken of in Revelation 13. Oh, it's spoken of throughout the Bible, but Revelation 13 brings it to life right in front of your face. There's a generation that's going to see that. So in the meantime, here's what I say. Matthew 6, Jesus told his disciples, he said, look, do not be fretting and wringing your hands over, what are we going to wear? What are we going to drink? What are we going to eat? The pagans worship and run after those things. What kind of clothes? I've got the, oh, you got designer tennis shoes? Wow, you're cool. I've got, look at my cell phone. It's more than, that is so evil. He says, but seek first my kingdom. Jesus said, and righteousness. And then all of these other things will be added to you. Isn't that what Calvin Coolidge said? He said, you start with the spiritual things. You start by seeking God's face. He'll take care of all the rest. But it starts there. That's our foundation. We have to determine, are we going to be in the 94% or the 6%? <laughs> you see? 94% that say, well, there's stuff about that biblical worldview we don't stand on. Yeah, well, we think a marriage can be anything. You know, you know it's cool. The Supreme Court said, and, you know, my body, my choice, yeah, except for the vaccine or masks. But, you know, but it's all just up and down and upside down and depends upon which little elite group you belong to. It's the same thing the colonists were dealing with until they finally opened cannons on them. Do you hear me? Amen. Today, on the Lord's Day, is the 245th celebration of our independence. A lot of the fire for that came from a couple of preachers. Isn't that something? And their congregations. And a bunch of men and women who are bold enough to meet, to plan, to pray to not do anything radical, asking their overlords, please reconsider what you're doing. And when it finally got radically evil, they had to do something radical. They asked for God's guidance and God's blessing. And America, America, God answered and he shed his grace on me. A lot of us have lived under that grace. We thanked him for it. We worship him. We serve him. We try to make our lives count for his kingdom. But so much of America has taken that grace and turned it into a cesspool of filth and have wallowed in it. And the Lord of heaven will not honor that. So what do we do, preacher? What do we do? Well, If individually, 
you're going to make a difference, then you and I are going to just have to continue to be real about who we are and where we stand. We can't play games with it. We got to speak the truth, stand on the truth with love and patience, but we cannot back up. We cannot back down. We've got to stand on it. We've got to continually speak out for the principles of right and righteousness, biblical principles, as well as, and this comes second, but they are tied into it, our constitutional rights and principles. We've got to stand on them or we lose them. What we don't stand on, they will take. Amen. We've got to do that. And then we have to continually be people of prayer and, as I said, some reality to our faith. And then we have to also, some of you, you run for office or at least support those that do, that have any sense of godliness or any sense of love for our nation. Oh, nobody's perfect. Reverend Duche wasn't perfect. But yet his sermons in scripture reading embolden others who were willing to stand. Do you see how that works? Our founding fathers are not a bunch of angels that came down from heaven. There's people like me and you. But God blessed those that would stand in faith and he honored that. And so we hang to these scriptural principles. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, the righteousness and kingdom of Jesus Christ. He's got to be first. He's the one to whom our knee bows ultimately, regardless of what else happens in this world. Amen, church? Amen. Settle that. Give the Lord a hand. Settle that. And then if you can't run for office, support those that do. You say, well, Carl, I, 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 I'm not a preacher, you know. I'm not a, well, then support preachers that are preaching it. And I don't mean money. I'm talking about just prayers and love and encouragement and don't walk around. Yeah, Carl Gallup's my preacher. I'm, you know, I said, don't do that. I mean, you don't have to sing my praises because I'm not what it's about. But if I'm representing the truth and someone says, oh, you're out there at that church, you need to stand up and say, daggum right I am. We're standing in the Word. Carl Gallup ain't perfect. I ain't perfect. And then say, and you're not perfect. But we're standing in the Word. And we're standing on our constitutional rights. And we're standing on those rights so that we can continue to share the Word without going to jail. There's all kinds of things that can be done and that we can do. But pray, pray, pray fervently, seriously. Stay involved. Stay equipped spiritually. Keep your head on a swivel and know the times we're living in. For I am convinced that all things eventually work together for good for those that know the Lord and love Him and are called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 31. And what then shall we say to this? If God is for us, ultimately, who can be against us? Amen? Give the Lord a hand of praise. Give the Lord a hand of praise. We're going to close this down. Our faith and our loyalty, first and foremost, regardless and above all, belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm passionate about this nation and the freedoms we have simply. This is our home. This is our heritage. This is the heritage of our children and our children's children. I'm passionate about that. But I know that ultimately all that's in the Lord's hands. But it doesn't mean we just sit back and say, Lord, you just do whatever you're going to do. We'll watch. He's never worked that way. Jesus put 12 disciples around him and he sent them out. He said, go, preach the word. And if people revile you, shake the dust off your feet and give up and cry and get in the dirt. No, shake the dust off your feet, go somewhere else and keep preaching, keep teaching, keep leading people, making disciples and baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Just go, go. You're in Satan's territory. But you can put on the spiritual armor because you're my representative. You're an ambassador for the kingdom that is to come. Amen. And in the end, we win. Understand the times we're living in. Be real about your faith in Jesus Christ. Do not be ashamed of him. Do not be ashamed of his word. Do not be ashamed of his people that are trying to live it or his pastors. And I'm not the only one. There are many, many thousands of others like me and like you. Do not be ashamed and do not, do not talk down about them and do not walk away and say, yeah, well, I know. you stand up for what is true and what is right and the Lord will honor that. And that's what we do. If you're here this morning, and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I pray before this day is over, you will. Romans 10, 9 says it like this. If you would confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved.
I pray that happens. Here's what I want us to do. I've got a little.